There's much to discuss. Let's get straight to our panel. Joining us from Beijing is Victor Ga. He's an international affairs commentator and analyst. Here with us in the studio is Song Zhang. He's the Washington bureau chief for Shanghai Wenhui Daily. From New York, we're joined by Fred Tang. He's the president of the America-China Public Affairs Institute. And Martin Jacques is the author of When China Rules the World, The End of the Western World and the Birth of a New Global Order. He joins us from London. Welcome to all of you. Victor, let's start with President Xi's speech. Uh, it was a rallying cry for his second term as president, big on Chinese unity, nationalistic in tone. What did you make of it? I think President Xi Jinping's uh, speech yesterday at the closing ceremony of the MPC was a very important historic landmark speech. He basically uh, was very humble and very elegant uh, when he thanked the MPC delegate and threw them to the Chinese people at large for the confidence placed in him when they elect him as the Chinese president. And I think he really rallied the people, the whole nation, around him, around the new government in achieving the ultimate goal of the Chinese national rejuvenation. And this is a national dream for more than 100 years, and the Chinese people now, according to President Xi Jinping, are getting closer and closer to this goal of national rejuvenation. And I think people listening to him see him as a really very capable leader, well-trusted, well-empowered now, and uh, we want to see whether uh, President Xi Jinping and the new Chinese leadership can really deliver the goal of leading the whole nation in the direction of national rejuvenation. Talking of direction, Martin Jacques, what were your main impressions of these meetings that have been uh, come to be known as the two sessions? Uh, what did it tell us about where China is heading? Well, I think that uh, the uh, leadership of the party and the government are absolutely determined to achieve uh, the kind of transformation that has been adopted uh, by the 19th Congress and so on. And they are aware of what a great challenge this is going to be. I think how difficult this is going to be uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, so, for example, on the economic front, which will ultimately be critical, um, the problem of uh, transforming the nature of the Chinese economy uh, towards something which is much more sophisticated, much more uh, technological, uh, based on research and development and so on, and to try and avoid the middle income trap which many countries have been caught in, uh, though not so much in East Asia, it must be said. And I think that uh, there's a, a great awareness that this is not going to be a, an easy task. Likewise, for example, um, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. I mean, that is a huge, hugely ambitious, and it certainly depends on the strength of the Chinese economy. So I think that the emphasis, in a way, of the Congress has been on leadership the ability of the leadership to carry this forward. And so, for example, um, the, big, the biggest reforms of ministries, of the government apparatus, the streamlining of it, the desire to make it more effective, uh, is clearly very central uh, to what's been agreed. And, of course, linked to that uh, is the National uh, Supervision Commission. In other words, continuing uh, what I think is, is crucial for the uh, standing of the party uh, in the country, and now uh, the standing of the government as well, uh, again, in, in the fight against corruption. Martin, that big challenge that you talk about, the challenge of changing the economy, uh, in a sense, has it already started? Because China has already started moving from being a manufacturing economy totally to being more of an innovative economy, hasn't it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this process, this process goes back actually to befo before Xi Jinping, because the Chinese economy was already uh, shifting in important senses, uh, you know, seven, eight years ago, uh, uh, in, in the immediate aftermath, for example, of the financial crisis. So this is a process. It's not something that, you know, uh, suddenly happens. It has to be a process. Um, but it's a very difficult process. And uh, uh, I, I, th I personally think the Chinese economy has done pretty well, in fact, better than I expected, in moving in this direction over the last five years. And uh, the strength of the technology companies, or the emergence uh, of the technology companies, is, a, is perhaps the most dramatic illustration of this. 
but it's you know this is still there's still a long way to go. Right. Uh, uh, income per head is still uh, limited in China, as we know. Um, and so the task, you know, the task lies ahead. And there are traps. You know, we 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 can't ignore that. Um, there's been the debt problem, and there's a, clearly a determination to push this back with the new leadership. Yeah. And also, you know, on the horizon, or rather, rather closer than the horizon now, is the threat of a trade war with the United States. If that happens, that will make this process more difficult. Fred, let's talk about foreign policy and what we heard at the two sessions. This is what President Xi had to say about China's foreign policy. Let's watch. China will continue to actively safeguard international fairness and justice. It proposes that all global affairs should be discussed by all people worldwide and does not place a forceful will on other people. China will continue to promote the construction of the Belt and Road Initiative and strengthen communication and cooperation with other countries so as to make its reform and opening up policies benefit mankind. So, Fred, would you say here, when uh, you hear that from the president about foreign policy, would you say that this is a policy of continuity, or are we going to see some big changes? This is definitely a policy of continuity. Uh, many of the countries don't understand how China can propose peace and growth, but they have to understand China's growth came from peace. You know, other countries have go through war to create their wealth and to create their war growth. But China is the last 40 years, just think about that. It is through the peaceful development that they have achieved such incredible success. So proposing peace and proposing working with the world, it's actually in line with what's making it successful. Song, what did you make of uh, the foreign policy initiatives you heard at two sessions, uh, especially foreign aid policy and, of course, the Belt and Road Initiative and how that fits into it? Uh, I, I think uh, China uh, had this uh, new international uh, development uh, uh, cooperation uh, agency. Uh, this time, that is a very uh, important uh, step. In fact, I think we learned from the practice of other countries, including uh, America, Japan, among uh, other countries. And as you know, uh, this OBOR has been uh, developing in the last five years, and uh, it has achieved a lot of uh, progress. But uh, uh, we also need to enhance our, uh, our uh, uh, kind of uh, cooperations on this, like grant and other uh, topics. And this new institution, uh, this new agency is going to be very helpful to work together with OBOR, because OBOR is basically more investment. And uh, this uh, administration is going to be responsible for, for international grant and other uh, cooperations. I think that these two will uh, work uh, side by side. Victor, uh, Martin Schock just told us a moment ago that one of the big challenges for China will be how to respond to what is this increasingly belligerent tone that we uh, hear coming out of Washington. Uh, Premier Li Keqing, he did address the possibility of a trade war heating up between the United States and China. Let's listen to what the Premier said. I think there will be no winner and benefit from any trade war between China and the United States. It is also contrary to the principle of trade if we describe trade by the word war. This is because problems related to trade should be solved by negotiations, consultations and discussions. I hope both parties will act rationally and not be led by emotions and avoid a trade war. So, Victor, how does China respond to what's coming out of Washington? What are the options that China has right now? I think in Beijing we hear the threatening uh, noises coming out of Washington, for example, trade tariff in the range of uh, 60 uh, uh, billion US dollars, for example, or even higher. And this is really very troublesome. And I think this is exactly what we do not need. And China does not need this, the United States does not need this, and the world does not need this. And between China and the United States, which has uh, which have a trade a volume up to about 600 billion U.S. dollars, one of the largest trade volume between any two countries, we really need to nurture the trading relations very well rather than really inflicting damages to the trading relations. And China will not just sit 
here and uh, suffer all these uh, blows from Washington. And I think China is prepared to uh, retaliate whenever it is necessary against all these uh, unjust uh, trade uh, tariffs to be imposed by the United States. And eventually, as the Chinese leaders said again and again, if trade war breaks out, neither China nor the United States will become winners. And I think uh, the United States probably will lose more, not only in terms of the trade, but also in terms of the damage to the global leadership that the United States cherished so much. So eventually, the United States may come out of the trade war in complete tatters. I think uh, uh, even China does not buy uh, uh, the, the argument from uh, the United States that uh, a kind of trade deficit uh, between us is a big problem. But still, I think we are ready to uh, solve this problem. I think Mr. Trump finally wants to see not to reduce the total volume of our trade, but he wants to uh, uh, export more goods to China. I think uh, China will be ready to import more goods from America, which can make this argument to be finally a win-win situation, especially like uh, this energy, this aeroplane, these soybeans, many, many other uh, uh, kind of products, we can uh, increase our import from America. Right, Martin, as uh, China formulates its response to what is coming out of the United States. What do we read into the fact that uh, we had Wang Shishan, who has been elevated to the position of vice president? What can you tell us about him? And he, is he the Chinese leader we should be looking to uh, to see what kind of response Beijing would have? Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, as, as I understand it, or from reading, it, reading what's been written, um, he, he, perhaps his central job will be uh, dealing with this relationship between the United States uh, and China. Um, I can't think of anyone better, actually, to handle this question. He's extremely experienced. Uh, he's very, very smart, and he knows the United States extremely well. And I think it's uh, an expression of the anxiety, actually, of the Chinese leadership and, uh, and, the, uh, and uh, the president. Uh, that, uh, that, you know, that, that um, Wang Qishan has been appointed to this position. I, 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 I must say I am pessimistic about this situation, and I've been pessimistic ever since the uh, presidential election, because I think Trump said uh, exactly what he intended to do. And in most areas, actually, despite people saying to the contrary, Trump has done more or less what he said he was going to do. And, of course, protection and a trade war against China uh, was central to this. So I, I, if you ask me what I think is likely to happen, of course, hopefully it won't happen, because I don't want a trade war, I don't want protectionism, but I think that the United States is going to go down this path. And I think it'll bring to an end, uh, the, well, really, the whole period of trade liberalization since the Second World War. Um, and I think, I agree, I don't think it's going to do the United States in the longer run any good whatsoever, because the United States actually, by imposing tariffs, is going to detract from the task it's got, which is to make its industries competitive. So, you know, protectionism, it, it, protectionism is a way of avoiding the problem and not tackling the problem. And I'm afraid, you know, America's in decline and it's reaching for protectionism in this situation. Now, hopefully, my pessimism will not be borne out and things will not go too far down this road. But I am pessimistic about it. And the other thing I would mention is that I'm in London at the moment. I'm in, you know, Europe. And the Europeans are very much against uh, protectionism. And of course, in the first instance, at least in these early promised tariffs, Europe is likely to suffer very severely, and, West, and uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, perhaps the most of all. Fred, what is your view on this? Uh, it sounds very alarming. Uh, is this some, could we see a trade war, or could this just be uh, negotiating tactics on the part of Trump? Uh, I think that, you know, we have a very unique president. It's unprecedented. And... Uh, him and his small team, uh, they like to exercise this bargaining contest, but rather than a trade war. I think what he's trying to do is to having a bargaining power. But he has to understand he is not with the American people. There's two letters just came out in the last couple of days, uh, one by the, all of the retail companies like Walmart and Costco and, 
and Macy's and so forth, they're all against it. And the second group is by all of the trade associations. I think when you add up, will be hundreds of American companies who's really against him having this 301 tariff. Uh, having this tariff uh, is only going to increase burdens on the U.S. consumers and is going to be hurting U.S. retailers. But it's not going to create more jobs. And, and in the letter, they also say that these jobs will go to other countries. They will not come back to the United States. And they will just find another lower cost provider right. and, and, and so forth. So uh, I, I do not think that uh, this will be uh, coming to fruition. I'm more optimistic about this. I think it's just uh, our president kind of making his grandiose gesture. Right, Fred, I want to stay with the trade issues. Uh, there have been a lot of complaints from United States business, United States companies, about lack of access to China. Premier Li did address this during two sessions. Let's listen. China will continue to safeguard free trade and the reform and open up policy, which is our basic state policy. If there's any change in China's open-door policy, I'd like to say it would only be opened wider. China's economy has been so integrated with the world's that closing China's door would mean blocking our way of development. So, Fred, what do you see China do as it uh, opens up uh, its doors to more international business and trade? I think they will uh, continue to open up, but they also have to have a capacity that's ready to open up. They cannot just open up and let it free flow and, and, and they will be creating chaos. So I do think the intention is to open up, but they want to have an orderly uh, open up of their different industries. Some of the things uh, China does not want to see is the kind of very aggressive financial uh, merger acquisitions and short sellings and so forth. Those things not going to see for a long time. But uh, I think most of the uh, traditional industry, China will slowly to open up. Okay, Song, let's move on to some of the other big issues that were discussed at two sessions, the mm -hmm. crackdown on corruption. You know, mm -hmm. one of the hallmarks of President Xi's uh, first term in office has been his crackdown on corruption. Now there's been uh, a new commission which mm -hmm. will expand that fight. What do you see happening? I think this is uh, a strong signal to the international community, also our, our uh, net, uh, Chinese people, that this anti-corruption uh, is not going to be an only uh, movement, it is going to be institu institutionalized. Because uh, previously, uh, we uh, basically, party is, has been doing this by itself, but now we have a, a supervision uh, a committee, which will be parallel to state council, uh, to uh, CP, uh, the MPC and uh, CPPCC, uh, which will uh, make this new institution to be independently uh, doing its job whenever uh, they feel uh, they, they, they have enough uh, kind of uh, evidence, they can uh, take actions uh, by themselves. So I think this anti-corruption and crackdown on corruption issue will continue in, in the coming decades. It, it is not going to be over uh, uh, with uh, time. Victor, one of the big successes that China has had is in the alleviation of poverty. Between 700 and 800 million Chinese have been brought out of poverty. This was addressed by President Xi. Uh, he has promised that there would be no poverty in rural China by 2020. How will China achieve that? Yes, indeed. I think uh, the fact that China has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and the total number is larger than the total amount of people lifted out of poverty in the Western countries ever since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Just imagine the scale and the magnitude of the work which has already been done. But now the new goal is by 2020, no person will be locked up in poverty and the whole country, the whole government, the whole society are now being fully mobilized to achieve this goal. And poverty can be attributed to many reasons. Some, for example, purely individual, some problem because of physical disease, etc. But there are also institutional problems, geographical problems. And I think the anti-poverty campaign now is very much focused on uh, eliminating all those factors which contribute to people being locked up in poverty. And I think this is the last battle of this war on poverty, and hopefully by 2020, uh, no person 
in China will be locked up in poverty. However, let me emphasize that the definition of poverty is not carved in stone. Uh, going forward, we need to refine poverty and really come up with a better measurement of what exactly poverty means so that people can always climb up and will get more benefits and see significant improvement in their living standards. All right, Martin Jacques, there, of course, has been big success in alleviating poverty, but what about inequality? Have you heard anything that addresses this problem? Well, not, not so much. I mean, I, I, have, I have been struck by the fact that, of course, there's this tremendous, as Victor said, this tremendous uh, uh, fight against poverty and enormous achievements. And if there's one thing, I think, w on worldwide that China is recognized for and praised for, it is this huge reduction in poverty. Mighty achievement. But China, at the same time, has become, over the years, uh, increasingly unequal. The Gini coefficient has steadily risen. Uh, and so I think that the problem of inequality is going to be a central question for China. In fact, I was at a meeting about three years ago, and uh, to my surprise and, and pl pleasure, actually, uh, Wang Qishan, it was a small meeting, but Wang Qishan said the next struggle has to be against uh, inequality. It is much too high. And I think this is a central problem. Now, one of the questions involved in this is the hukou system. Because while the hukou system is in place, it means that those who don't have citizenship in the major centers are inevitably, by and large, not always, it doesn't ha happen in completely like this, but tend to have poorer social facilities, health, education, and so on. So it does, and that, to, to tackle that problem is going to be, is very difficult. It was talked about several years ago, but I, I feel it's gone a bit into the background and perhaps is being postponed. But it will be a central question because actually in the longer run, uh, the hukou system is probably the biggest single key to inequality. And it will be impossible for China to maintain this uh, difference, actually, the disparity between those who live in the big cities uh, and those uh, who are uh, discriminated against, in a sense, by uh, where, they, where, where, where their citizenship is held. So I think that will become a major question for the Chinese leadership at some point. But there's no sign at the moment that it's going to occupy a central position in the agenda. It looks as if it's, you know, there'll, there'll be a few, a few years before it's tackled in a major way. Song, there's also been some concern in China about the efficiency of government, the uh, mm -hmm. accountability in government as well. Uh, what do we know about reforms and restructure in government? Uh, I would say uh, this time the uh, reshuffle of the uh, state council is a very big issue and uh, it has, uh, uh, I think, the possibility to solve uh, many, uh, many uh, long-standing uh, issues, especially like natural uh, resource, uh, this uh, ministry and uh, the uh, immigration uh, ministry among uh, many other uh, new new institutions and also integration of other uh, original uh, current uh, ministries yeah. will uh, be helpful to, to solve the long kind of uh, standing uh, difficulty and make the government to be more efficient. Fred, very quickly, I've got 30 seconds left. Looking at the big picture here, after two sessions, what does the future look uh, like for China, in your view? I think the future looks very bright. I think that this, since the 19th Congress to this two sessions, it's probably transformational. I think that it will be equal in weight, if not more, than the open and reform policy uh, launched by Deng Xiaoping. This will really impact China for the next 30 to 40 years of these two sessions meetings. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.